on the side of St George's Town Hall, there is a huge mural commemorating the Battle of Cable Street. Despite the name, this wasn't a battle in a war, it was a clash between police and anti-fascist protesters. To find out why it happened, we're going to have to go back to the East End in the 1930s. By the 1930s, the East End has acquired a substantial Jewish community. They're mostly from poorer Eastern European backgrounds, either immigrants or the children of immigrants. Many of them came to England escaping pogroms in Russia, the Ukraine or Poland, and they particularly congregate in Stepney, where there are 60,000 Jews. In 1931, more than a quarter of Stepney residents are foreign born. Stepney is poor and overcrowded and still trying to get over the Great Depression. Although London is doing better than many areas in the north, the docks and the factories in the East End are badly hit. Traditional industries that employ many working class people in the East End are in decline. And the government isn't doing well at fixing the problem. Keynesian economics doesn't exist yet. So rather than solving depression by putting money in the pockets of consumers, It's thought that the best solution to unemployment is to cut wages and unemployment benefit so that people will be forced by poverty to take any job going. Of course, this is rubbish. The depression wasn't caused by a wave of people who just felt like quitting their jobs to go on the dole. So it doesn't work. So the government is unable to deal with the economic situation which causes a lot of resentment and frustration. People start turning away from the main parties. On the left, membership in the Communist Party more than doubles in the two years from 1935 to 1937. There's also a lot of support for the anti-fascists fighting Franco in the Spanish Civil War. Although Britain is officially neutral, many British people send money and even volunteer to fight for the Spanish Republicans. And on the right... Fascism is on the rise in Europe, with governments in Italy, Germany, and later Spain. Germany, especially, seems to be pulling out of the Great Depression better than other countries. So in 1932, Oswald Mosley creates the British Union of Fascists, and it's meant to be the British counterpart to the Italian fascist party led by Mussolini, whom Mosley greatly admires. By 1934, they have 40,000 members. And over the next few years, they devote more and more of their time and attention to anti-Semitism. It's worth remembering how much more normal and even respectable anti-Semitism is in the 1930s. The Liberal MP, Charles Kerr, can just openly say, there are many influential people in this country supporting the Communist Party, the insidious propaganda of which is backed by the Jews. The British Brothers League, an anti-immigrant organisation, at one point has 45,000 members and a Tory MP as leader. Books are circulated like the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which claims to be a master plan for Jews to take over the world, although it had already been exposed as a forgery back in the 20s. Anti-Semitic literature shifts the blame for the depression onto Jewish communities, even though those communities tend to be poor themselves. Old stereotypes of Jews as exploitative moneylenders are used, and because many Jewish immigrants are from Russia, many people try and associate them with the threat of communism. Jews are at the same time painted as greedy capitalists and subversive communists. So, on the 26th of September 1936, the BUF announces that they're going to march their uniformed troops from the city to meetings in the East End, going right through the Jewish quarter. They plan to start at Royal Mint Street and go down either Whitechapel Road or Commercial Road. Some more established figures on the left, such as Labour leaders, the Daily Herald, and the Board of Deputies of British Jews, which is mostly made up of wealthier Jews whose families have been in the country for longer, urge people to just ignore the march. An advert taken out in the Jewish Chronicle warns Jews that getting involved would be actively helping anti-Semitism and Jew-baiting. So the locals realise they're not going to be getting any help from officials. So they decide to organise against the march themselves. The Jewish People's Council Against Fascism and Anti-Semitism, the JPC, 
gathers a petition with 100,000 signatures asking the Home Secretary to shut down Mosley's March, but he replies that a ban would be undemocratic. So the JPC, the Communist Party and local trade unions start organising counter-demonstrations. Communist newspaper The Daily Worker publishes a map of the proposed route, telling protesters to gather at Gardner's Corner. Leaflets for a planned demo in Trafalgar Square are printed over at the last minute saying, Alteration! Rally to Oldgate! 2pm! Their plan is to block the route so that the fascists can't get through. In response, the police send 6,000 men to make sure the march goes ahead. On the 4th of October, 3,000 black shirts assemble at Royal Mint Street. The anti-fascists gather at Gardner's Corner and Whitechapel Road. It's hard to estimate the number of counter-demonstrators. Estimates range from 100,000 to 500,000. They chanted slogans such as They shall not pass and Down with fascism. Four anti-fascist tram drivers just left their trams in the road where they were used by the protesters as barricades. The police order them to disperse and when they refuse they are beaten by mounted officers. One 12-year-old boy is hit by a truncheon from horseback. Local cafes are turned into first aid stations by the Communist Party. Now, Gardner's Corner is well and truly blocked, so the black shirts can't go that way. They could go via St George's Street instead, but that would take them out of the Jewish neighbourhood. So they try to go down Cable Street. Cable Street has three barricades, including one that's made of an overturned lorry. Irish dockers turn up and they pull up the cobblestones to build up the barricades, and the locals gather at their windows to pelt the police with bricks, cobblestones and bottles. People bring their furniture out into the street to block the way, and children roll marbles under the hooves of police horses. Eventually, the Metropolitan Police Commissioner, Sir Philip Game, orders Mosley to call off the march, and offers to let him hold a meeting in Hyde Park instead. They decide against it, they turn around and go back into the city, where they disperse. 79 protesters and six fascists are arrested. The JPC organises free legal aid for the protesters, but many faced fines and even hard labour in prison. Two days later, Mosley gets married, in Germany, in Joseph Goebbels' house, with Hitler as one of the guests. Later that year, a law is passed banning political uniforms and marching through the East End. Afterwards, the BUF spins the event in their favour, presenting themselves as injured victims. This is successful. They do enjoy a boost in popularity after the battle. Estimates at the time suggest they got 2,000 new members, with most of the recruits coming from the East End. But they never make it to Parliament, and in 1940 they are disbanded. Mosley and 800 BUF members are imprisoned for the duration of World War II. One leading member, William Joyce, escapes to Germany to broadcast Nazi propaganda back to Britain. At the end of the war, he is recaptured and hanged for treason. Forty years later, in 1976, a mural is commissioned for the side of the local town hall. Two artists called Dave Binnington and Desmond Rochford start work on it, using interviews from local people to inform the design. The characters' faces are based on photographs of the battle, and in the lower left-hand corner there's also a nod to the newer Bangladeshi immigrant communities that were predominant in the area when the mural was painted. Thanks to vandalism by fascists, the piece wasn't completed until 1982, with two new artists, Paul Butler and Ray Walker, called in to help finish it. It's been defaced several times since then. While Butler was restoring the mural in the 90s, he had to have a police guard to make sure that thugs didn't try and shake him off his scaffolding. These days, there's a special varnish on it to protect the paint, and if it's vandalised again, it can be cleaned off easily. I feel quite conflicted about the Battle of Cable Street. At its face, it's an obvious win for anti-fascism. There's something quite romantic about a local community coming together to protect their neighbours in the face of a totalitarian menace. But if I'd been there, would I have been out on the streets building barricades? Or would I have been urging Jewish people to stay away? I like to think I know which side of history I'd be on. But I don't know if I'd be brave enough to face a mounted charge of policemen with truncheons. And of course, this question isn't moot. 
there are a lot of similarities between the Britain of the 1930s and Britain today. We're pulling out of a recession, fascism is on the rise in Europe, and we have a wave of poor immigrants fleeing persecution who are being demonised in the press. When we're thinking about how to combat fascism in the modern day, we can look to Cable Street for lessons, but it's not clear what those lessons should be. One answer can be found in what the anti-fascists did after Cable Street. The Communist Party in that area reached out to the parts of the East End where Mosley was trying to garner new supporters. The reason these people were attracted to fascism was because it promised them relief from their economic struggles. So when the Stepney Tenants Defence League helped them organise against their exploitative lanyards, they realised that it wasn't the Jews that were the problem. And a lot of them left fascism for good. Now, you could argue that grown-ups shouldn't need financial help to persuade them not to be racist. And I would agree with you. But if it works, then we all win. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for watching this episode of the London History Channel. I know this episode is a bit more political than my normal fare, um, which is why I've not been brave enough to show my face on this one. Um, I've been compiling a Google map of all the locations we've visited so far, so you can take your own London tour. If you click on a pin, it comes up with the video, so you can take me with you too. Uh, it's a little sparse at the moment, but as I make more episodes, more pins will be added, and there's a link to that in the description, where you can also find more sources if you want to find out more about the Battle of Cable Street. Thanks again, and I'll see you for the next one.